You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, interviews from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s with voices from the past. Could Oswald have had the time to fire the three shots, and later that becomes he didn't have enough time, and then it becomes no marksman in the world could have fired the shots that Oswald fired in the necessary time, and he wasn't a good marksman, the rifle was terrible, and they become ingrained as part of our consciousness. Investigative journalist Gerald Posner. Today on Now I've Heard Everything, I'm Bill Thompson. It has now been 60 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy in Dallas. And yet, to this day, his death has spawned countless conspiracy theories. But 30 years ago, an investigative journalist wrote a book that was one of the most definitive books about the Kennedy assassination, and it reached the same conclusion that the Warren Commission had reached 30 years earlier, that Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president and that he acted alone. The author of that book, called Case Closed, was Gerald Posner. And he used technology that was unavailable and unheard of back in the 60s, but reached the same conclusion. So here now, from 1993, Gerald Posner. Are you, ironically, finding that people don't want to hear that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone? You know, Bill, I was surprised. I thought that people would not want to hear it, that the reaction would be, Oswald... So, and a big yawn, and they would say, this is what we heard 30 years ago, and they would ignore it. Instead, what's happened, which I must say I'm surprised at, but pleasantly so, is that I underestimated the degree to which this position, saying that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone, is the most controversial position after 30 years. People, instead of ignoring it, are incredulous. They say, you're kidding. You mean you did a massive re-examination of the case, and that's the conclusion you reached? How is it possible? And then they ask you all the questions they've heard over time that are their own doubts built about the case. So it has received a lot of attention, and people are buying and reading it. I mean, this Sunday it will be on the New York Times nonfiction list, uh, number 11. So uh, I am happy that people are at least giving it an opportunity. Uh, that fact doesn't surprise me. I don't, the, the thing that, that most pleased me as a reader of this book, let alone as a journalist, is that you took a head-on Every other bit of, of theory, of information, of, of, of uh, speculation, and you said, this is why it's wrong. Well, I think you have to do that. One of, the, one of the problems here is the Warren Commission is so generally dismissed because it's considered old information. I mean, here it was in 1964, the report comes out, and then we've had 30 years almost nonstop of conspiracy theories given to us in books or documentaries or even sometimes in a $50 million slick Hollywood film by Oliver Stone. But what the, nobody has answered those. The commission never set up an apparatus after it disbanded to deal with the questions that came up over its own research or the errors that it's made. So they sit on the record. And after a while, these doubts and questions raised become facts. They get repeated so many times. Could Oswald have had the time to fire the three shots? Was there enough time? And later that becomes he didn't have enough time. And then it becomes no marksman in the world could have fired the shots that Oswald fired in the necessary time. And he wasn't a good marksman. The rifle was terrible. And they become ingrained as part of our consciousness. So I think it's absolutely important, if you come to this conclusion, to go far beyond the Warren Commission and deal, as you say, with all of the issues the conspiracy press has raised and show people either that they're credible or not credible. Now, you've got the advantage that the Warren Commission did not of computer enhancement all sorts of really sophisticated, uh, the, the kinds of technology that could not have been imagined in 1964. You reached the conclusion that they reached. Did they reach theirs by, by stumbling happenstance? Well, they did by sort of what I call uh, lawyer's reasoning. And as you know, I have a law degree as well, so I appreciate their deductive reasoning on this. What they said is, in the end, the Warren Commission, my God, he had time for only three shots, Lee Harvey Oswald, and one shot evidently missed, and one was the fatal headshot. So Kennedy and Connolly are both wounded. We think one bullet must have done it. We can't figure out any other way for the assassination to work. But they didn't have positive evidence to establish the so-called magic bullet, which has become the infamous uh, bullet that wounded both of these men. What I think the new computer enhancements and animation allow us to do is answer the questions in a positive way to prove with evidence that the magic bullet, that the headshot, the timing of the shots, all are very, very, not only possible, 
but conclusive evidence that Oswald had enough time, over eight seconds, to fire the three shots at Dealey Plaza, not four and a half to five as previously thought. We now know the precise moment that the so-called magic bullet took place because we see it happen on the film. We put Governor Connolly and President Kennedy in their positions in the car, and a computer can answer the questions as to whether they're lined up for one bullet to inflict all the wounds, and it's a straight-line trajectory through the two of them. No twists, no turns, right turns, left turns, as Oliver Stone tells us. And we can see the headshot as well, that final fatal shot, and see the explosion, the wound take place out the front of the president's head, further evidence that the bullet comes from the rear. This technology, I think, is critical in the sense that it helps us answer what happened at Didi Plaza. It wasn't available to the commission, it wasn't available to the House Select Committee, and it allowed both of those official government agencies to blunder as to what they thought the precise timing was and what happened. But you've also got, you as the author of this book, have a, a, a delicate task. You have to tell us, the reader, that we're not expert on matters of ballistics, that when someone is shot from behind, their body will move back and the, the fact that his head jerks back is not evidence that he was shot from the front. You know, Bill, it's such an interesting thing. When I first saw this Zapruder film and I see Kennedy's head move back into the left, it's not the reaction you expect from a shot that comes from the rear. Uh, because I've seen all the Hollywood westerns and I've seen cop shows and everything else, but I've only seen two people ever killed in my life um, on film. One was Jack Kennedy and the other is Lee Harvey Oswald. I've never seen other people killed. So I don't have a lot of experience, and most of us don't, in terms of real-life death. So what I did is I went back to the experts. I went back to the forensics pathologists and the ballistics experts, and I said, look at this film, and what do you conclude? Does this mean that Ken the fact that Kennedy, as you said, moved back into the left so violently, does that mean he was shot from the front? And they said, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, several things happen. Not only on the enhanced film, as I said before, do we see the explosion, and, and it's graphic to describe it, but there's no other way. It's brain and blood matter. There's a red mist that forms to the front of the president's head as it explodes out the front. But as the cortex of the brain is destroyed, the body goes into a neuromuscular seizure. It sends impulses down the spine, and it makes the back muscles twitch. It starts to uh, predominate. He's wrapped into a back brace, the president is. Remember, it's underneath his chest and all around his thighs. And then Dr. Louis Alvarez, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, calculated what he called the jet effect, the force of the bullet going into the rear of the president's head at 2,000 feet a second, a 6.5 millimeter shell, versus the force of this explosion of this wound out the front right side of the president's head. And he calculated that the force of that wound was much greater than the force of the bullet. And as a jet rocket propels up from the pad with all of its uh, fuel boosting out and forcing it the other way, as this jet effect, the brain and blood tissue, blows out the right front it pushes the president in the opposite direction, back into the left. And that is exactly what we see on the Zapruder film, back into the left as that car starts to speed up, further forcing him back into the left. Still, though, even to come to that particular conclusion, you have to, again, as the author, wade through Howard Donahue, who says that it was a Secret Service agent right. in the car behind, Dr. Crenshaw, who says, I was in the operating room. He had to have been shot from the front. Right. As a matter of fact, it's very interesting with Donahue, mortal error, who says there was a, a Secret Service agent, Hickey, who grabbed an AR-15 and by mistake shot the president. He at least agrees that the president was shot from the rear and still moved back <laughs> into the left. The bad news is that he's wrong on the Secret Service agent. I'll tell you why. There's a photograph taken of Didi Plaza from the south side of Elm Street looking toward the grassy knoll almost at the moment of the headshot, and it shows the backup car in its frame, and it, just before the president is shot, the Secret Service agents in the backup car have not yet grabbed the automatic rifle. It's not up in the air at all. Hickey doesn't grab the rifle until they've passed under the triple underpass and they're on their way out of Stemmons. So it's an interesting theory, but it's proven wrong by the photographic evidence. As for Dr. Crenshaw, I interview, as you know in here, some eight principal physicians mm -hmm. at Parkland Hospital, and it is clear to me that on the weight of the evidence that Dr. Crenshaw is absolutely wrong. Uh, I, I'm not saying that he's lying. I believe he believes what he says, but his, for some reason he's, he's not right in his re recollection. He says he saw the front neck wound on the president, and um, that, the other doctors say that's not true. Only five of them saw it. Dr. Crenshaw came in only at the end. He was a resident. He held a bag as the president was given IV. And he also described a large hole in the back mm -hmm. of the president's head, which would indicate that the shot came from the front and blew a large gaping exit wound in the 
president's rear head. Um, the other doctors say, absolutely false. We never turned the president over. We never examined the wounds. Mrs. Kennedy was in the room the entire time. The president had all this blood matted into his very thick hair. You couldn't tell where the wound stopped or started. And we certainly never even looked at the back of the president's head where Dr. Crenshaw says he saw a gaping wound. So A, Dr. Crenshaw couldn't have seen it even if it was there. But secondly, we now know from looking at the x-ray photos and the autopsy photos that Dr. Crenshaw is just wrong. Yet there are a fair number of people who, having read the David Lifton book, are convinced all the photos have been altered. Right. He yeah. was surgically worked on. Right. They stole that body. They did something to now, it. Let me tell you, this it was some of my favorite theories get involved in here. Favorite in the terms of we have the most entertaining theories and the most outlandish at the same time, and maybe they go hand in hand. Um, what happens is I can use the x-rays in the photos from the autopsy to prove conclusively that the president is shot only twice. He's hit only twice, I should say, from the rear. Then you will get a whole group of conspiracy theorists, Robert Grodin, Harrison Livingston, and others, who will say, aha, you fool, you're relying on the x-ray photos and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the x-rays themselves from the autopsy. Those are doctored. They're forgeries. I can then go to the photographic panels, the experts used by the House Select Committee, some 22 of the nation's leading experts, who went back and on the x-rays compared them to base x-rays of John Kennedy in different locations around the country. An x-ray can be like a fingerprint, and they concluded 100% that those were accurate x-rays. The photos had no evidence of tampering or fakery, and John Stringer, who took the photos, had seen the photos in 66 and said, those are my photos. However... Some people then say, as Grodin does, well, how do we know that the base x-rays weren't also swapped? Now we're expanding the conspiracy to hundreds. But David Lifton, who has the body swapping theory in, in best evidence, has a very interesting way of dealing with this. He says, all right, I agree that the x-rays in the photos from the autopsy are real. But they are real photos of a body that's been tampered with. So that's why it looks as though the president shot from the rear. So you now have taken it to another uh, case. And my favorite part of this theory is that not only do we get a secret covert team that gets through Love Field where hundreds of people are waiting for the plane to take off and they get onto the plane right under the nose of Jackie and the Secret Service and President Johnson and they unstrap the coffin, they take off the seal, it's hermetically sealed, they take out President's body, they put something else inside so it's the same weight so you won't notice the difference, they reseal the coffin and restrap it, they get off, now they do surgery which I'm told by doctors cannot be performed in a couple of hours to make these wounds like they come from the rear and then according to the theory, they say, oh, my God, we forgot to get the same casket. We don't have a bronze coffin. So they put the body back into a gray shipping casket. And then they say, oh, and we didn't get any white sheets. You know, when we stole the president's body, it was wrapped in white sheets. Well, hell, we'll just put him in this body bag. So they put him in a body bag. Now, what's interesting about Lifton's theory is that there are autopsy doctors, Humes and Boswell and FBI agents and others who swear, and they've signed affidavits and they've testified about this, that at Bethesda, they received a bronze shipping casket. They opened it up and there inside is the president's body wrapped in white sheets and they took it out and they did this in the morgue. Now, if David Lifton is correct that the president's body was really sent in a gray shipping casket in a body bag, these people are lying. They're part of the cover-up. They're conspirators. So assuming that they are conspirators, they're willing to lie for you anyway. Why would you then, even if you put the president in the wrong shipping casket, a gray shipping casket in a body bag, you know you've got him in the wrong material, not send him into these conspirators who are waiting in the morgue to lie for you anyway. Instead, you put it in a hallway so all technicians run across it and they can put their hands inside and take the president out. It falls apart by the, what I call just our own good common sense sometimes. You were prepared, though, from the outset, I gather, to be convinced when, when you began this project to be convinced either way well here's my bias when i when we all have biases on the kennedy assassination i never thought it was the government i was a poli sci major at berkeley i view the government as very inefficient and bungling and i can't imagine a they could pull off something this smoothly and b keep it a secret for 30 years if i had any bias toward a theory i thought the mob was possible because of jack ruby's connection on sunday and his mob connections or i thought it might have been three or four of oswald's friends who sort of egged him on and knew he was doing it, not really an active conspiracy, but others who had knowledge, and they kept it secret because I knew that for this to work for so long, it had to be a small conspiracy. We're not talking about many people. Uh, but then as I went through it, uh, I was quickly disabused of those ideas. We've been talking now for several minutes about what happened on those few seconds that day in Dallas, but why is it important for us to know for the many years before that what Lee Harvey Oswald was like? Uh, 
Bill, I think that Oswald is the key to figuring out the assassination. Trajectories are interesting, the single bullet and what happens on the Zapruder film, and I donate a chapter to them, as you know. But half the book is about Lee Harvey Oswald from childhood on, because I'm convinced by understanding him, we get a better idea of what, why Dallas took place. And what I find through this life, I was even surprised by it, is a very disturbed young man from a very early age, has trouble adjusting in school, moves 21 times with his mother by the time he's 16, 12 different schools, um, has a tendency toward violence, punches his mother in the face, uh, uh, pulls a knife on his sister-in-law, chases his brother with a butcher knife, uh, goes into the Marines, he's court-martialed twice, the, his colleagues never get along with him, they give him a terrible time, he's very pressed down, and decides he fixates on the Soviet Union. He has this half-baked uh, political philosophy, his IQ is around 100, of communism and anarchism, goes over there and they tell him to leave, tries to kill himself. And they put him in a hospital. Two Soviet psychiatrists interview him. I, I, the KGB file still has them secret, but I have information from them in here. They conclude he's mentally unstable. And then the KGB watches him for two years while he's in Minsk because they say, you know what? Maybe he's just pretending to be a nut and he's really an American agent. And they conclude at the end that he is in fact the lone eccentric psychopath that he appears to be when he first comes over. He comes back to the U.S. with a Russian wife, has a terrible marriage. He's beating her constantly. Um, he can't hold a job. He loses one after the other. The FBI is harassing him in his view. They're interrogating him all the time. And he decides he's going to make a contribution to his political cause, and that is going to be the assassination of General Edwin Walker, a right-wing army general in Dallas, not Jack Kennedy. His goal is just knocking off Walker, and he fails at it. Yet another one of Lee Harvey Oswald's failures. The bullet goes along the grazes the window frame and just misses Walker's head. So by the summer of 63, his life is quite out of control. He decides to go to Cuba. It's the new place, Nirvana, for him. Goes down to Mexico City. They reject him. And when he returns to Dallas in October, November of 63, he's somebody who literally is careening downward. You almost see this spiral out of control in his life. And on November 19th, when two Dallas newspapers print the president's motorcade and is passing in front of his place of work, a job he got, by the way, in early October from friends of his wife, Marina, not from the FBI or the CIA or mafia people. It's very clear how he got the job there. I go into it in detail in the book. He is given essentially history on a silver platter. Um, no longer is it Edwin Walker, but he has a chance to throw a much bigger cog into the machinery of government, and that's going to be Jack Kennedy. So in other words, he was aiming at Kennedy and not Connolly because of his draft record. <laughs> right, Bill, absolutely. People <laughs> say because Connolly had been Secretary of the Treasury and he had an undesirable Marine discharge, he was aiming at Connolly. Connolly would have been a much easier target. He had visited Dallas other times without all the Secret Service protection that was going to be around the president. Let me let me ask you about one. I'm running out of time real fast, but I wanted to ask you about one of the many things that Oliver Stone raised in the book. All right, we see the, the, the recreation. They're in the, the Sixth Floor Depository, and when you when you see the film, you uh, you I'm sure have, have seen it yourself. Why didn't Oswald f Absolutely. aim down Houston People Street? People say why didn't he take the the straight shot that was coming straight up? There are two reasons for it. First, I'm not a shooter, but I talk to uh, ballistics people and shooters, and they say that if you're using a telescopic sight at a target coming toward you. When you're looking down, the target keeps dropping underneath your sight as it moves closer to you. You have to make a more rapid adjustment with your gun and following that target that if you're aiming at a target moving away from you, where your line of sight can also see it above the scope. But I think there's a second and very important reason. Oswald had created a sniper's nest on that sixth floor window where he is kitty corner against a brick wall. So the two neighboring buildings along Houston Street, Dow Tex and the Records Building, people are hanging out the windows. They cannot see him when he's shooting down Elm. This is not a suicide mission. It's a man who wants to get away from Dini Plaza and he succeeds. If he takes the straight shot as the car is coming toward him, he has both buildings looking directly at him as he's hanging out the window and taking that shot. And I think it's speculation here because we'll never know in his mind as to why he sets up for the Elm Street shot. I think the second reason, wanting to get out and not be seen, is the more important reason. You've given us so much to think about in this book. The... Well, I hope so, and I hope that anybody who has seen the film JFK or is thinking of watching it on video will look at this book, because I must tell you that I find that propaganda film to be a real abomination of history, um, so much so that, I mean, I, I don't almost overstate the case when I say if you read this book, you'll find that the only thing I think Oliver Stone got right is the date that Kennedy was killed. Gerald Posner is 69 now. His most recent book was in 2020, an expose of Big Pharma. Now, you can get a copy of Case Closed by Gerald Posner by tapping on the link in our show notes or by going to our website, heardeverything.com. We may earn an Amazon commission if you make a purchase. 
HeardEverything.com is where you'll also hear my 2007 conversation with someone else who reached the same conclusion as the Warren Commission and the same conclusion as Gerald Posner. My 2007 interview with famed prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi. The conspiracy theorists have dominated the stage and they've convinced the majority of Americans now that the Warren Commission uh, w- was just a cover-up. And it's just nonsense. It's all nonsense. And don't miss my 2010 interview with the Secret Service agent who was on the back of that limousine that day, helping Mrs. Kennedy get back into the car, Clint Hill. When she came out in the trunk, she didn't come out there to get out of the car. She came out there to retrieve something that came off the president's head. My job was to get her back in the car. And of course, we post new episodes of Now I've Heard Everything here every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you can find us everywhere you listen to podcasts, including YouTube. And thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, she was part of an aristocratic Philadelphia family, but later turned to an unusual occupation that got her into big trouble. She was known as the Mayflower Madam. My 1987 interview with Sidney Biddle Barrows. I don't want to let everybody think that all escort services are run like this. One of the things that I tried to do was to make it fun and to make it glamorous and to give the girls an opportunity to have a good time. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. And have a happy Thanksgiving. I'm Bill Thompson.